Welcome everyone to the session, Why Does Building a Robust Automation Framework Matter by Cameron Bradley. So we are glad Cameron can join us today. Thank you for the lovely introduction and a big hello to everyone out there. I'm, I'm coming to you from Australia and I, I'm definitely really excited to present Why Does Building a Robust Automation Framework Matter? So a bit about myself. So I currently lead the QA practice at Bunnings. For those that haven't heard of the Bunnings name, you've definitely heard it if you're Australian because it's the number one retailer in Australia, particularly in the home tools segment. I began my career as a software engineer working across iOS and web. And during this time, I discovered a passion for ensuring what we develop is being delivered with quality and speed to our customers. I followed this passion and shifted my career to focus on improving the quality function. I guess a couple of quick highlights is, you know, our team at Tabcorp, which was the company I previously worked for, was a top nominee for the best agile test team in the world, a global competition judged by our peers. And we're alongside such global companies as Google, Microsoft and Amazon. And finally, I founded Testing Talks and Testing Talks is a wonderful company, pretty well known brand name in Australia. Um, it's all about providing high quality conferences, online events and test automation courses for our community. So these are some of the takeaways I'm hoping that attendees actually get from this talk. I want to really give takeaways of, you know, why does automation framework architecture matter? The importance of building a proof of concept for your automation framework, leveraging engineers and your team to help build a robust automation framework, some key object orientated design principles to use across your frameworks, how this approach can support multiple automation frameworks, and finally some observations, some successes and challenges. So I guess, you know, why does automation framework architecture matter? Now, many arguments could be made about the order of these, but from the top, we've got accommodate team skill sets. So, you know, we want to build a framework that should enable our most technical, but also our least technical team members to be efficient automation engineers. We want it to be easy to maintain and update over time. We want low complexity code that is not intimidating to fresh eyes. We want to enable best practice and iterations on the framework, both the architecture and code with ease. And we want a consistent architecture approach that also supports things like training, pair programming, skilling up even across teams. And finally, we want low code and easy to reuse. We want to spend less time doing code and more time doing automation. So a little bit on the importance of proof of concepting. So, you know, we want to understand supported features. You know, does it support iframes, for example? So this is really getting the idea out there of, you know, let's let's try and do a little bit of a proof of concept of our framework before we actually decide on a solution. And this is about, you know, looking at different opportunities, you know, different frameworks, different architectures, you know, things like building team buy-in. This is something you can actually develop from a proof of concept. You bring everyone in the team into it. You get as many opinions as possible. You get your best engineers in the room and you really start having those stimulating discussions, which we all know get very passionate when it comes to automation. Some frameworks, you know, they actually cater to certain software better. You know, do you have long forms in your application? Again, do you have iframes? These are the sorts of considerations you have to make when you're actually picking your framework. This is one that could be debatable, architectural discussions, you know, something I really love to do is actually stimulate architecture discussions as part of the proof of concept, really get that kind of thought process happening as our proof of concept forms, we actually start to think of the architecture we'll use now in our sort of solution we go with in the end. Finally, you know, quick wins generate momentum. And, and that's the thing, right, like as a proof of concept, you can actually prove it out, you can kick some goals, you can start to really develop a, a sort of message of a success and where this automation framework is going to go, some of the benefits the team are going to see. And then finally, measure and review, you know, which is actually choosing the framework that you go forward with. You know, you've, maybe you've done two proof of concepts and you've proved out the benefits, you've, you've noticed which ones it's going to work with well, which system it's going to work well with, and you actually pick the system. So, you know, one of the keys for our proof of concept and, and how we came up with this robust automation framework we're going to talk about very shortly is that we brought the team on the journey. You know, we discussed team-wide as a group. What was important to our automation framework architecture? I remember I was in my first month at Bunnings and I literally invited, I said to the top te test engineering lead, I said, who are the top engineers in the company? 
I want them to be the most passionate people in these meetings where we discuss architecture and our proof of concept. I want them to challenge us on everything. We set out with a goal to make the architecture so generic we could replace the underlying framework. And I'll explain what I mean there, but really what we're trying to do is create a framework that was, again, easy to use for our most technical and our least technical that our best technical people could really engineer the framework and engineer the improvements, but that our least technical could not only build their knowledge and learn the framework, but be efficient automation engineers from the get-go. And we'll speak to that more as well. As I said, we invited the top engineers in the team to a Teams channel as well. And we asked that they actually review all our proof of concept pull requests. And we told them to go hard. We, we said, you know, if you don't like the code, if you don't like the architecture, tell us, let's have a meeting, let's pay a program on it. We want to get the best possible proof of concept we can get out of this at the end of the, at the, end of the POC. And then we performed multiple iterations of showcases, meetings, pair programming, and code review to refine our framework architecture. And something I really want to highlight there is showcases incredibly important. Just like this presentation right now, it's about constantly bringing the team on the journey, showing the team your wins. What are you doing? What's the architecture? Who's in on this? Because ultimately that's what's gonna really lead to momentum as you build out your framework with the team later. So here's something we decided to use Cucumber. So we didn't use Cucumber because of the BDD benefits. You know, if we talked to the founder of Cucumber and told that person why we use Cucumber, they'd probably throw up. It's not something that was originally intended for Cucumber. We actually use Cucumber to enable generic architecture for two key reasons. We wanted a shorter learning curve so we could actually reduce duplication of code and have generic step definitions that could work across any feature or functionality, any interaction or assertion. And then we wanted strong collaboration. So we actually wanted developers and testers to both contribute to this framework. And finally, we have a large practice at Bunnings. And as I say, we have a broad skill levels from someone that's never done automation to someone who's done a lot of automation and comes from a very extensive engineering background. And we wanted to build a framework that enabled both. And, and Cucumber definitely allowed us to do that. And I'll show you how soon. So the original proof of concept we actually put together was Cypress versus Playwright. And I've just added a few videos out of fear that um, potentially running both the frameworks at the same time during a, a live presentation might be a dangerous idea. So all the all those demos and the code is all, all in the slide pack, just for safety really. But um, as you can see, the proof of concept is just basically running through the Bunnings website. That one's in Cypress, which took 19.39 seconds, just your basic end-to-end -end scenario that logs into an account, pretty much standard across most web applications these days. And then on the other side, Playwright. And right away, you can actually see something really interesting there, which is the Cypress one is a lot slower. And for those that have used both and, and those that understand the architecture and how Cypress works, it's really got a lot to do with those network requests being completed. You know. When we started automation at Bunnings and we were really starting from scratch, you know, we were just automating against the UAT environment just to get this proof of concept up. Yeah, we wanted to focus on local host automation and mock servers and all that great stuff as well. But we just wanted to get a starting point to build this framework. But as you can see from two proof of concepts, just on time taken alone, we can pretty much see that Playwright might be a better option for the Bunnings website because the Bunnings website has a lot of network requests. And because Cypress awaits those network requests, that simple test is double the time, which is really interesting. So what's so special about this POC though? I mean, everyone's done a POC, right? Well, the answer is the framework architecture was the exact same. And I wanna show you how. So on the left, you've got Playwright. On the right, you've got Selenium and they're the exact same framework. So basically you've got one that's Cucumber, Selenium and TypeScript. And then the other one, you've got Cucumber, Playwright and TypeScript. And thanks to Cucumber and that use of generic step definitions, what we can actually build is using a lot of object oriented design principles is the exact same architecture in both, obviously substituting out what's required to start Playwright and what's required to start Selenium. And we'll dig into that in a second as well. So as you can see, we basically have the exact same Cucumber scenario for our home page, And then we have our exact same code in step. And you'll notice there's only really one difference here and it's in the Playwright test we're passing page because basically Playwright runs off the browser context and page 
whereas Selenium, as many of you will definitely know, runs off that driver. But as you can see, the architecture of the step is the exact same. There's no code difference except for passing of the page and the driver. Then you go to the support function where we actually navigate to page. And again, you can see we're actually got the exact same code again. So we're basically bringing in that page or that driver for Selenium. We're determining our host. We're passing in our host, which determines our URL. And then you'll notice again the difference in Playwright, we're using page.go to, which is the sort of default function to navigate. And in Selenium, we're using driver.get, right? So basically there's two differences, but the architecture of the framework is the exact same still at this point. Let's keep moving through the code. So let's go to the last bit of this test. So we've got our package.json, so where we actually kick off the actual tests themselves. And once again, you'll see, they're pretty much exactly the same. In fact, you could have this be the exact same. I, I left a common config file in one and, and one doesn't, and that's just because one was designed for Windows and one was designed for uh, Mac. But generally speaking, they run the exact same executable commands. And I will show you how all this works very soon. That's when we're really gonna dig into the code and see how this all ties together. But what I wanna stress to you at this point is what was very unique about our proof of concept was that it was the exact same code exact same architecture, running the exact same test. The only difference was one had Playwright and one had Selenium. Finally, what was the difference? Because obviously there was a difference, right? And again, I just wanted to show you that that's in our initialize. So basically we initialized the actual framework on runtime. Obviously for Playwright, we have to set up that browser, that context and that page. Whereas in Selenium, we need to set up that driver. And that's the only difference. So th that init function is literally the only di thing that's actually different between both those frameworks and the use of obviously page.goto and driver.navigate, et cetera. Okay, so what did we discover through our proof of concept? So we discovered a lot. So we discovered things like about cross-origin capability with Cypress being quite complex, you know, navigating between different URLs, um, external of the, e.g. The, the actual main web application. You know, we discovered that there wasn't great iframe support. You know, you could use some external libraries in Cypress, but it wasn't native to Cypress itself. And that's totally understandable with the underlying architecture of Cypress. You know, underlying files weren't native in Cypress. And I, I just got to take a pause here because generally speaking, when we went into this proof of concept, everyone thought Cypress was going to be a clear winner. Like Playwright, this was over 10 months ago, right? So we thought, you know, Playwright's so new, barely anyone seems to even be talking about it yet. Everyone's loving Cypress. You know, we'd all use Cypress a little bit and we're really excited to explore it more and use it more in depth. But this proof of concept completely changed our minds. And it, it, again, it goes back to things like, you know, that automatic await network response completion with Cypress, you know, really wasn't the right candidate for the Bunnings website, which had a lot of slow responses. Um, you know, that, that issue is, you know, things like no need for scroll on long forms in Playwright, you know, Cypress is really good at that as well. But we noticed when we, we did this in Selenium, because keep in mind, we did this across Selenium, Playwright and Cypress, Selenium was pretty much off right away because unfortunately it still has those issues with scroll that we all know about on long forms. And while we know we can get around those with a few scroll twos and a few different ways to do it, uh, it's it's just flawless in Playwright. And, and that really surprised us. But again, it was also flawless in Cypress that. So it wasn't, that wasn't the clear winner um, for us, really. It just came down to the fact that the Bunnings website had a lot of internal iframes, so hidden iframes, and Cypress did not deal well with that. Like we had to do a lot of sort of hacks, if you will, to actually get this framework up and running in our website using Cypress. And that didn't seem like a good thing if we were only in the proof of concept. On top of that, those network requests, as of, I'll keep going back to it, but it was so important because it, it basically showed that every test was gonna be running a lot slower. On top of that, Playwright had really good support for Safari which is something our customers use a lot. Um, it also was really flawless when it came to parallel browsers, particularly on our local host. Um, so needless to say, our outcome was, and it surprised us all, that Cucumber, Playwright and TypeScript was actually the framework that we would go forward with. It was the clear winner, uh, much to the shock of all of us indeed. 
So how did we build this framework architecture? You know, what OLD principles helped us build our robust automation architecture? So we leveraged a mixture of OLD principles in our design, and, it's, and it really started with how we initialized Cucumber World. So for those that haven't heard of Cucumber World, it's actually a really interesting stuff. So basically when you use Cucumber, you can also introduce this concept of Cucumber World, which is within the, uh, in the, the actual Cucumber framework. And what it enables you to do is it actually enables you to pass segregated global configuration between scenarios. So I don't know about you, but definitely in my early days as a, as a QA, I would define global variables and potentially set those global variables throughout my automation suite. Well, that was obviously dangerous, right? Because if I was running multiple tests in parallel that set that global variable at the same time, it might cause a test to be on my actual test suite to be unstable. So with Cucumber World, you can actually pass all these, all these, all these segregated global configurations all at the same time. So you could be setting that global variable in every test running in parallel and it's going to pass because it's completely segregated. So highly recommend if you're out there and you're using Cucumber to look into Cucumber world because you'll see the benefits of it throughout this, this sort of presentation. So as you can see, where do we start? You know, we start now hooks, right? That's kind of where the automation framework will always start when you're using Cucumber, that before hook. So in Cucumber, you know, you've got your before, you've got your after, you've got your before all and your after all. And as they say, basically this code will execute before your, your scenario, before all your scenarios, after your scenario, or after all your scenarios. And as you can see here, we've got our before. So this is actually going to execute before every single scenario. So what do we do? We basically console log out running the Cucumber scenarios, just for a nicety. And then we set our context options. And as you'll see there, we're actually leveraging Playwright. So this is a minor change to the architecture that's different because Playwright offers you the ability to video record for each scenario, which is really cool. Um, and then we actually initialize Cucumber World. So this enables us to actually create our new browser context and page before every test. Now, <laughs> That was really challenging to work out when this, this, this framework was first worked on. And it's because there was limited playwright docu documentation in those days, particularly for Cucumber. Don't get me wrong, you could Google, you know, uh, Cucumber playwright TypeScript framework, and it would show you how to connect a basic test, but there was nothing online for how to use Cucumber world with playwright. So we literally had to figure this out for ourselves by digging into the actual playwright framework and working out how we could basically segregate the browser context and page. So then we could actually fully leverage Cucumber in Cucumber world. So this is actually really cool stuff. Um, but as you can see, as we initialize, we basically close any existing browser context and page that might exist. We open that new browser, we create that new browser context, and we create that new page and we return a screen object that basically will be available throughout our entire Cucumber scenario. But again, I wanna stress this because we're using Cucumber World and because we're using Playwright, we're in this beautiful scenario right now and we've barely kicked off this framework where we've got segregated global configuration and we've got segregated browser context and page per browser. So nothing shared. You've got a perfectly self-contained test on every test, whether it's running one at a time, two at a time, five at a time, 20 at a time, everything's contained within its own scenario. So we're off to an awesome start. All right, now we go ahead and determine our browser. So Playwright in those days, um, really, really the main support was for Chromium, Firefox and WebKit, which is actually amazing because, you know, for, for those of us that use Selenium a lot as well, you know, that Safari binary isn't quite as good as WebKit in that uh, WebKit will give you parallel browsers from the get-go. You know, it will give you headless mode from the get-go. Um, and then obviously Chromium and Firefox are, are great binaries as well and obviously really representative of the latest Chrome and Firefox browsers. But basically what this function does, and as you can imagine and keep this in your mind, could work with any framework. It's basically an allowing us to pass an environment variable, which we'll show a bit more as well soon of either our Chromium, Firefox or WebKit, and that will determine what our actual automation framework, what the browser is that we will run on. So next, we actually leverage our index.tx to execute a runtime in source via the Cucumber.js. 
And this was one of the most complex parts of setup since the Cucumber JS with additional customization is actually not designed to work with TypeScript just yet. So let me explain a bit more. So the Cucumber JS, as it sounds, is very well designed for JavaScript. It's not very well designed for TypeScript. Now that won't hurt you if you're doing a automation framework using Cucumber without Cucumber World once again, or without wanting to customize your Cucumber JS runtime arguments, you'll get away with it. But if you want to actually update those arguments, unfortunately, you are going to need to come up with a solution that converts your TS files into JS files. So the Cucumber, the index basically, which will contain your custom Cucumber JS runtime arguments, will execute. And I'll show you that in the next slide, because obviously there's a bit there. But basically, it works beautifully. You just have to convert it to JavaScript to really get the full benefits and unlock the full benefits of the Cucumber JS. So as you can see, some minor work done in our package JSON to basically introduce Babel. So for those that haven't heard of Babel, it basically allows you to convert your TS files into JS. So it converts TypeScript to JavaScript pops it in a file of your choosing, as you can see here, into the dist folder. And then you'll basically find all the TS that we've done as part of our TypeScript framework converted over to JS, including our index.ts, which for those that do a lot of TypeScript will know is that first initialized file called. So if you, if you initialize source, it's actually going to look for an index.ts by default. And if that contains your Cucumber runtime arguments, that's what's going to be executed. So let's look at that. So I don't want to over, over confuse. So let's see how it really looks. So we used Babel, as I said, to compile our TypeScript to JavaScript on runtime. So we could use and, and then customize the Cucumber JS to enable us to leverage Cucumber World. So to actually use Cucumber World, you actually need to pass it in as dash dash world parameters inside the Cucumber JS arguments. But what we want to do is we want to have the ability to have customized config for our hosts, our pages, our element mappings, all those key things that make up an, a sort of world-class automation framework that can do all the things you would expect to do in any web application. So we need to pass that. Hence why we needed to basically have our Cucumber Jack TS, because this is a TypeScript framework, as you can see there on the right, but this is the trick, right? So in our, in our index, so in our, in our cucumber.js, this would sit basically in your root directory. It will actually just exports and require dot slash dist, right? And so when we actually run this framework, it's going to look in the dist and it's not going to find the cucumber TS. That's right. It's going to find the cucumber.js. And that is exactly what we need. So we can write our framework in TypeScript and unlock all the beautiful benefits of TypeScript. But when it comes to compilation, we're going to have this bad boy running in JavaScript, which is going to play beautifully with the Cucumber JS runner and get us in a position where we can run our framework as is. And, and, and that's, again, something that was a big challenge, right? There was no documentation for this. This is something we had to work out as a team. And thank God we'd ran those proof of concepts, right? Because we had those developers on board. We, were, we had these questions. We could bring in our best engineers. They were a part of the architecture. They were a part of the POC. They'd, they had that buy-in we talked about. So they were on the journey and they helped us come up with this solution. And by leveraging Cucumber World parameters, we can then pass in our host configuration, page configuration, and element mappings on our runtime. So segregated between each scenario. So just on the left there, this is what you call your world.ts. And this is a default file that basically the, the Cucumber world, all, all the initialization and the constructor sits within. And it's actually where you define the things that you want to have as segregated global configuration. Now, you can see we've got global config and we've got global variables. So to quickly explain what they are, think global config, that's where you're going to have your pages, you know, your home page, your login page. You're going to have your route there, your rejects. So you're going to match it up. You're going to have your hosts. You know, are we going to our local host? Are we going to our production.com.au host? You know, and then you're going to have your elements, you know, your login button, your submit button. This is where all this stuff's going to be managed. And we do that using .jsons, and I'll, I'll show you that in a minute as well. Finally, we have our global variables. And this is where we can do things like store, e.g. a stored value, you know? What about those tests where you don't know what the balance is going to be? You know, maybe you're running these on production as well, and you want to 
store your balance at the start of the test and assert that it's five dollars less after you do something that's you or you spend five dollars by using this approach that will be segregated data for this scenario so you won't have any issue running that scenario 20 times at the same time doing all different types of updates everything's going to work because we've put in the hard work to initialize cucumber world and have that segregated context we can then leverage config.jsons to create a set of host config, page config, and mapping config. And that's what we just talked about. So this is where you have this really clean folder structure, right? So you've basically got E2E, config, mappings. In there, you've got all your element mappings. So you've got your home page mappings. Maybe it's your header logo. Maybe it's your sign-in button. And then you've got your common JSON, right? Because we're dealing with single page applications. You're going to have element mappings that sit across multiple things, e.g. your headers and your footers. And then you're going to have your host.json. This is, again, where you're going to have things like your local host, your production URLs, because you want to run this in local host. You want to run it on multiple in test environments. You want to run production, right? And then you've got your pages. And that's where you define all the different pages within the application itself. So we can navigate around the application or jump straight to a part of our application or, or even just know where to draw our page elements from. On the left there, you can basically see in that index.ts, remember, converted to JS on runtime. We've got all the things around getting that JSON out of those files based on a host path or a URLs path that will define an environment variable in our common.env. So then we can actually leverage config.jsons to create a set of host configs, page configs at runtime. So you've got your pages.json, you've got your home, you've set it to your slash, right? Home page, usually it's just a dead route, it's just a slash. Then you've got your host.json, simple enough. We'll run this on our local host, which is our HTTP local host 3000. We've got our first element identifier we want to interact with. It's our contacts header, data ID contacts. That's what's in our HTML. That's how we'll reference this element. And finally, what does this all console log? Well, it produces an object that looks a lot like this. So it tells us that we've got a common.json, a home.json, and in that we've got our header logo and our contacts header. And as you can imagine, we'll be able to soon draw from that using the parameters we pass through with Cucumber. So let's finish out our automation test. Let's get this bad boy up and running. So let's go back to our Cucumber scenario now. We've got our home page up. We've navigated to our home page. We've spun up the framework. We've got Cucumber World initialized. We're about to hit our first page. Hallelujah. We've just hit our home page. Congratulations. Let's move on to the next step. So we want to go and the header logo should be displayed. So we just want to assert that the home page has a header logo. So let's go ahead and step into that step. So what we can do here is we can actually leverage the config.jsons to create a set of host configs, page configs at runtime once again. And we do that because it's already initialized at runtime. It's, it's actually initialized within the framework. It's there, but we're actually going to pass it via scenario world. So you'll see their async function, this scenario world, that's going to draw in that object we just saw in the console log directly into this step definition for that scenario completely segregated once again. So as you can see, we then log out what we want to log out from a debugging perspective, but this is a cool line. And this can work across any step for the rest of our framework. Const element identifier equals get element locator, page element key, global config. So we go off and retrieve our element locator based on that parameter header logo. And where did we just see that? We saw it in our console log because that was what we drawed down at the start when the framework ran and we stored in our global config from, from our JSON files. We also have our custom wait for function there, and we retrieve elements, true or false, and assert if the element is visible accordingly. We decided to not use playwright tests um, for those wondering why we decided to use native assertions. And it's because the default playwright test library as it did not work perfectly with Cucumber. So this is really interesting as well, right? Like it has support for Cucumber, but because Playwright's still sort of in its infamy, it's still a relatively new framework. It's not perfectly set up for it yet. So we actually found that using native assertions was a better approach. We also discovered that by using negate, it would enable us to have our step do two things instead of one. So our step is actually the blah should not be displayed or the blah should be displayed. It can actually do both, which is really cool. Then we retrieve our element identifier based on our cucumber header logo. So this is just the logic behind that get element locator. And as you can see, it's really simple stuff. Look, you'd think that would be doing a lot of complex code, but it's not. It's literally just looking in that page elements mapping object we saw console logged out before. It's going, hey, which page are we on? 
Okay, we're on the home page. So we need to go in and then grab our element identifier from our home.json. Really simple stuff, but really clever what it's doing. So next we actually retrieve our page based on our current URL. So this was actually something amazing that was done by one of our top engineers. So we originally were setting our page ID via the cucumber. You know, given I am on the home page, if I click the login button, then I'm on the login page. This engineer was like, why aren't you doing this dynamically? Why aren't you setting a regex in your pages.json and then creating a function that can actually go off, grab your URL, match it against your pages and tell you what page you're on? So we removed that entire need to have that step to tell us what page we're on to determine where we get our actual element mappings. That was there for us. We created this function that literally goes off and retrieves the page we're on and stores that in the framework and allows us to pull down our mapping element identifiers. This was so cool. And just another backtracking benefit of that proof of concept, getting the team on board, those showcases, that passion we were bringing and that determination to build something that's never really been built before. So the get element function, as you can imagine, so this would sit in our HTML behavior, and this is where the majority of the differentiation would happen, e.g. between a Playwright or Selenium framework. This is where we actually use Playwright to get element. And as you can see there, we're just finding an element, otherwise we return null in that function. All right, there you go. So, and the header logo should be displayed. We can use this sim single step to assert on any visible or not vis visible element on our website. And if you're thinking, wait, you could use this on any website, you're absolutely right. So you could copy and paste this entire framework into your web project right now, update that element identifier in the mappings, update the pages in the configs, so any JSON updates we're talking about, copy and paste this step, and this will work for you as well. And that's really a really genius part of this framework. So let's finish it out. So now our final step for our scenario, then the contacts header should contain the contacts Let's go ahead and step in. So notice now we can leverage all our existing HTML behavior functions to serve an entirely new purpose, right? So we're using that negate again. We're using that get element locator, exactly the same function. We're using our wait for selector and we've got a new get element text, which basically will sit in that HTML behavior, thus giving us new functionality by using playwright functions, right? But isn't that amazing? We've basically got a completely different step. One was asserting against an element, now we're asserting against text, but we've literally had to add no code. We've got a new step, but we haven't actually had to add any new code really to our functionality except that get element text. So let's go have a look at that. So our get element text function to retrieve our text, pretty standard. Again, it just goes off, uses playwright.text content and retrieves our text from our element. But a bing, but a boom, the, so the contact setter should contain the text contacts up and running, working as expected. And we've just created another step that could assert on any text in our application or any text on any application in the world, as long as we update that mappings in, in that config folder. So let's review some of these key concepts we've just introduced because we've done a bit. So we've got Cucumber World. So we leverage Cucumber World to enable segregated page host elements mappings for each scenario across our automation suite. We introduced Babel for TS to JavaScript conversion. So we leveraged Babel to enable Cucumber.js customization while still being able to build our automation framework with TypeScript, check. We initialized our mappings on runtime. We are setting all our pages, hosts and element mappings as objects. We can easily match via our Cucumber parameters. Dynamic pages. So we created a function that determines what page we are on actually from our pages.json based on the URL that the framework actually pulls down as part of that step. We don't even have to tell it what page we're on, it tells us. And then it knows where to draw down those page element attributes based on what the .json's called, whether it's home.json or login.json. Generic steps. We created generic steps and reusable cucumber steps that can be used for the same purpose across both interactions and assertions. So you can use these steps across the entire application. So you can get to a point where you've got hundreds of tests for your web application potentially automated from less than 50 step definitions. We have reusable functions. So we created generic and reusable functions that can be leveraged across the entire framework and service the functions of many steps. So 
success, we have built a framework that is so architecturally sound, we can literally substitute our playwright for Selenium, not lose any tests, not lose any step definitions or functions. And here's a working actual example of both. So we actually created a small bare bones React application um, at Bunnings. Um, a few of us got together and built this as part of a sort of hack day. It's been amazing actually. So it's, it's literally just a, a real bare bones React application. It's got some of the major components you'd expect to see inside the playground. But what's really cool about it, right? Is that if you've got a test suite of like 50 tests that validate through the entire test application, you're really validating the entire framework works. And because this framework is so generic in architecture and can be copied and pasted from project to project, it's actually architecturally sufficient enough that you could create a single framework and you could actually write the features on each project and have a single common framework between multiple projects. And that's something we did at Tabcorp with a similar approach where we had over 3000 automation tests across 16 web applications running off a single framework that was maintained by a technology team of over 100 at Bunnings. This is a new framework. You know, we've got it up and running now for Bunnings. We've got it up and running for a new system called Hybris. So we're in the infamy of kind of getting that common framework going across both applications now. This, uh, this framework architecturally has, has just gone leaps and bounds. And again, it goes back to that POC, I think. You know, when we, we did the, the version of it at Tab and that was using Protractor and TypeScript. No, actually, sorry, it was using Cucumber, Protractor and JavaScript. Um, we did it predominantly as a test team with some additional help from developers, especially as we worked together to build out the suite. But um, at Bunnings, it's it's been hand in hand with the engineers and, and we've seen the dividends from that. Uh, just on the right, we've also got the Playwright version of the framework running as well. Um, I decided not to include the Cypress one. I just wanted to show you that we did get this up and running in multiple frameworks. So again, Cypress, Selenium and Playwright. So yeah, um, on the next slide as well, I just wanted to also show you um, the structural, um, the file folder structure and show you how it's the exact same because that's the thing, right? It can literally be the exact same. You can have the exact same in features. You can have the exact same reporter, step definitions, setup and support. Now under that code, what's different? As we saw, there'll be some minor changes in the hooks as we initialize our suite, whether it's running on a driver or if it's running on the page. You're gonna have some minor differences around the world because we're gonna have potentially different browsers we use. You know, in Selenium, you're gonna have Chrome and Safari. You know, in Playwright, you're gonna have Chromium and WebKit, for example. The, the steps themselves, exactly the same, literally no difference. The support functions, that's, that's where the real change is, right? Although you've got the exact same code, one is gonna be calling Selenium functions and one is gonna be calling Playwright functions. So key successes, just to round this out. So we saw increased collaboration. We saw significant increases in collaboration across our team using the framework approach that was easy to use and enabled all our team members to be contributors. We saw massive improvements in code quality. Since the code was so minimal and generic, we found maintaining code quality through collaboration and pull request review to be very easy and straightforward. Many tests from minimal code. This framework approach has enabled us to create hundreds of automation tests across multiple applications with very little code, less time coding and more time adding automation tests leveraging across multiple projects. We are able to literally copy and paste this framework into a new project, then update our hosts and pages and element mapping JSON files for the application and have a fully function, functional automation framework. We can just get started copying and pasting those steps right away. Key challenges, selling the engineers on Cucumber. Many engineers have had bad experiences with Cucumber in the past. You know, maybe they've had debates about how it should be used or if BDD is the right way or not. What we found was those showcases and that POC solved all those problems. The engineers saw that we wanted to use Cucumber for its architectural benefits, for its enablement benefits, and they got fully on board and were very supportive. And then, of course, proving the upfront effort is worth it. You know, as you can see with this framework approach, there's a bit of upfront effort, right? Like you've got to build out that kind of, you know, actually getting Cucumber World working, for example, like we saw, you know, we had to overcome some hurdles. We had to build out those initial step definitions. But of course, once you get over that hump, once you've paid down that initial debt, you're over the hump and you're literally in that low code, no code scenario where you're basically able to just add Cucumber steps and build out those tests. So 
you might be saying, well, how, how can I learn about this framework? Well, fortunately, I have gone off and, and spent about 100 plus hours or more um, developing a course on Udemy. Um, and it's, it's a best selling course, which is fantastic. The community really seemed to love the course. It's got a very high rating as well. And you can actually learn, as we say, how to build a world class automation framework in either Cucumber Playwright or TypeScript or Cucumber Selenium TypeScript. So please check it out. Um, we offer full support as well. So, you know, if you want to join up, we'll invite you straight away to our Slack. We're pretty much happy to help. You know, we love this stuff. I'm a tester through and through. I love this community. I'll be your direct point of contact as your help and guidance for that course as well. Um, let's go on that journey together. A little bit about Testing Talks Conference. So, you know, I established Testing Talks Conference in 2019. And what it's all about is similar to Selenium Conf bringing amazing people together, amazing people from our community, working hands-on doing amazing things. But on top of that, it's also about swag, fun, games, prizes. It's shaping up to be a massive event. We've got some incredible sponsors on board, some that are obviously joined in with this conference as well, from Browser Stack to Appley Tools to Lambda Test. And it's going to be a big day. The way we think of it is we want it to be a party for our community, a day the community, a day the community can look forward to. So please join us. It's going to be an amazing day, amazing speakers, and so much fun. Finally, let's connect on LinkedIn. You know, um, I love to connect with community. I'm pretty much available around the clock to have a chat, have a yarn, have a coffee if you're in Melbourne. Definitely add me up. You know, I live and breathe this stuff and I love the community. I love testing. So go ahead and connect and I'll definitely connect back. Thanks, everyone. Any questions? So we can see some questions in Q&A. Oh, let's check that out. Is BDD implemented in the whole team or is just the QA team using it? This is a fantastic question. So we are using this across the team now. So when you think about BDD, traditionally, you're thinking about, you know, the way we define our, our business requirements, you know, given I am on the when I do that, then I see that. Um, we don't use BDD in its traditional sense. So you won't actually see our test cases read as a story per se. We use it for that generic step definition architecture you would have seen throughout this, this presentation. So it's a little bit different, but we definitely follow the idea of readable tests, just not for the traditional purpose of BDD. Now, the developers are definitely across it because they're across the whole process, but they're not doing BDD, they're, they're using Cucumber for its architectural benefits and, and, and easy story writing and the enablement of the team. Uh, so it's a little bit different. Uh, no question, but enjoyed listening. Full of energy. Did you take a breath? Manoj, good question. I did take a breath. I should have drunk more water, but I was too excited to present here today. Thanks for that, my friend. Um, what about dashboard in Playwright? Um, is that uh, the Playwright inspector? Or the the is it, are you asking if there's a dashboard equivalent similar to Cypress and Playwright? I'm not quite sure. I'll speak to both. So basically, um, I found Playwright Inspector really good. Um, it's pretty cool. It's like this tool that basically, with a simple environment variable set, will spin up a debugger that you can basically view as the test runs and shows you what elements you're hitting and what it's doing in the HTML. I feel like it's still in its early days. It's a little bit um, temperamental. Like you'll be running a test and it'll just shut down and you'll have to run your test to see it again. But it's super beneficial overall. And we definitely teach it in the course as well because we see the benefits of that. Um, as far as dashboards in Playwright, you know, we're using Cucumber. So we use the Cucumber HTML reporter, which is sort of the go-to reporter um, for, for Cucumber. So we didn't use any sort of Playwright dashboard per se. Also, it doesn't have a dashboard like that of the equivalent of Cypress either. It's really just a test reporter. Nonetheless, really cool stuff though. Awesome. I think that's all the questions. Okay, that's on the question. Yep. One more if you want. Oh, I think we're out of time, mate. Up to you, up to you. Okay. Yep. You can take. Yeah, I've got time. Okay. Can you compare performance with Selenium and Playwright? Playwright came out ahead. Um, so if you run our exact framework uh, on our bare bones React application with Playwright and you run the same framework with Selenium running on the exact same architecture like you just saw, running on the same browser binary, we actually saw about a 10 second improvement overall across the 50 tests when running in Playwright. So minor improvement. Um, however, very similar. To be honest, 
I found them both extremely beneficial and that's why I did a, a course on both of them. I think it comes down to personal preference. The only thing I will say is Playwright handles long forms a hell of a lot better still than Selenium. Like I still found with the Selenium framework, we had to add a lot of those scroll to elements just to get us over the hump. But generally speaking, both really great frameworks and Selenium, Selenium 4.0 has, has come a long way, highly rated. And I think it's back, back. It's, it's definitely back. Other stories written in Gherkin. So you just have just to implement it in the framework or are your adoptions in the scripts unnecessary? Why are your stories written in Gherkin? So when we write our business requirements, we work with our BAs to, to produce them in sort of a given and when equivalent, but they don't break down the steps into generic step definitions like we act, we actually add them in our tests. So we haven't looked at aligning our, our tests, our tests perfectly with our business requirements yet. Uh, it's just not something we've, we've endeavoured to do. And I'm not sure if we will. I think the process is really working right now. And I think the testers and, and developers are happy to let a little bit of exploration happen when they write their tests rather than just trying to replicate the BA requirements coming through on the cards. And thanks Cameron for sharing your experience with us today. Thanks everyone.